Thanks, Brasher. How are you, my friend? Terrific. Thanks very much for having me, Dill. Um, I've heard a lot. Gorney, obviously, my podcast partner's come on before, and I've heard only good things. Yeah, I'm very well, excited. It was funny because when we first wanted to get you and Gorney on, I remember hitting up the actual uh, Gus and Gorney Instagram yeah. page. Which I run, funnily and enough. And you run that. So yeah. I don't know if I was talking to you or the CEO or the, the, the CFO maybe of that account, but, you know, I was just trying to get the double combo, ended up just getting Gorney, now yeah. I've got you. So You've is there a better value for money. Is there a riff? No, no, no. We're rock solid, um, especially now more than ever. Um, we've had a, a lot of feedback. So we used to do it with um, just Gorney and then they would sort of rotate my position and then the second week they did it with Rick Lever who just – Sank it, yeah. So, um, they said <laughs> Jake Lever, Jake Lever, yeah. yeah. So, after that, it's just been him and I, and so we're yeah. tight. So, there's no, no riff there, no yeah. boring podcast or anything like that. We're um, we're good. And well, that's, thanks for having me. No, I appreciate that's a Gus and Gorney podcast. Make sure you check that one out. There's yeah, the, the plug, thanks yeah, very much. But we'll show notes, show notes, show notes. Um, how are you, my friend? Terrific, yeah. Good, um, good start to the season, um, for the D's. Um, playing some good golf, which I think we're going to go into later. But um, nah, mate, everything's everything's ticking along. Um, I know you're a big fan of the show, and you you listen Huge to most fan. episodes. But have we like I always sort of maybe come up with a story sometimes of how we'd met or like how we'd come to being friends. Sure, it, we played a game of footy together uh, against each other, and that's the first time I remember meeting you in the flesh. Mm. And then there's honestly a pretty significant gap. Yeah, and then. Sorrento think, Hotel. Yeah, Sorrento Hotel. And then yeah. <laughs> that, probably don't need to say much more yeah, than that. Yeah. Um, hopefully my girlfriend's not listening. She got angry at me for that yeah. weekend. But we had um, nah, there's, uh, friendships and bonds, all sorts of stuff yeah. that, that goes on down there. So, um, yeah, basically brothers after that. Yeah. And um, here we are. No, it's good to be here. It's good to find having the show. Um, let's get into this golf game. Sure. Because it's something that you're yep. very well known for. I am like a late comer into this. And, yeah. and people are... You know, probably get sick of me talking about. It. I'm off. I'm off 90. That's a good moment. start, mate. Um, you start I, I started off like 25, mm-hmm. came down, and this is what's happened with golf. And I'm sure you know this might have happened when you were like 13 or something. But I played last week in Sydney and I hit 41 points. That's insane. Yeah, and I, then the last next game I had, I had 41 points. Oh my god! The other day, but then the next game I had, I hit 13. Yeah. So that happens, <laughs> and that happens, and it's been interesting my golf journey. Like I'm all right now, but I I've got all brothers and my old man actually owns a golf business um, and so got us into golf very early and had all those big oscillations up and yeah. down. Good rounds, bad rounds, good shots, bad shots. But it's only really been the last couple of years when I've started taking it more seriously. Do you practice and do all that stuff? Um, no, nah, like I, that's my biggest sort of thing at the moment is like I hit out, I go out there mm. and it's like the amateur that, you know, is playing footy, I'm assuming. they don't, No one wants to go to training. 100%. But everyone wants to play. Exactly. So it's like, am I going to spend four hours at the driving range or I'm just going to go play a game? And yeah. then as soon as I get out there mid-round, I'm like, fuck, it should have gone to the driving range. Yeah. I really, uh, that's what changed. We were speaking before, we're training out at Casey. And I um, would, you know, be the, this classic, I would be like, oh, you know, there's a hand, single finger handicapper in there. I just couldn't be asked, you know, practicing. But then because we're driving home from Casey, I live in Elwood and my golf course is in the middle. So I'd very easy for me just to turn left. And that's, that's the secret, mate. Surprise, yeah. surprise. The secret's practice. Coaches? Uh, I've got a couple of mates there who are off scratch. So I play a bit with them and get some tips off them. Oscar McDonald, you might know yeah, him. He's, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. The big porterhouse has helped me along the way. And um, here I am. So so what do you want for the moment? 4.7. I, I, I was one over the card yesterday um, wow. at Royal Melbourne. And... There's honestly, like, I, th- I took some inspiration, I think, from the Masters. You've all, you would have been watching yeah. that pretty closely. And I think I just look at them and think, geez, like, and it's stupid, but like I say, like, not really hitting anything that I can't hit. Like, I can, <laughs> if I swing hard enough, wow. I can hit it far and I can putt all right. And it's all there. And then, um, yeah, it just came together. It was weird. It was weird. And then so, Cam Smith crumbled, which yeah. really hurt the other day. Like 4.7, that's pretty impressive. So Oscar yeah. McDonald, for those listening, is he, he's off scratch, isn't he? 3.2 oh, three. at the moment. So I'm coming for him, yeah. but he was off scratch um, for ages. Um, I think he's got a bit of a sore back, which is, hasn't okay. helped. Jack Nunes is actually off 3.5 as that's well. going. Jay yeah. Hunt at our club's off 3.8. Mm-hmm. So I'm catching him. I'm second at the moment. I've knocked off Steve May. He's yeah. got nothing. I have a um, theory on golf, though. Like, as, it, as I said, I'm quite amateur. I'm flat 19 at the moment. And I think 19 handicappers have a lot more fun than, 100%. than four time. handicappers. Because we hit a good shot and it's like the best day ever. You 100%. make a par, you're happy. Whereas, you know, you guys are like putting it a metre from the hole and you're upset. Yeah, you're exactly right. And the better I've got, the more frustrating it gets. Because the more good shots you hit yeah. and then you always inevitably stuff one up. And it's like, oh, 
you know, I should be better than that. And yeah. the sort of pressure comes on and it's a bit of a love-hate relationship. But I'm doing all right at the moment. You've hit a hole in one though. I have. And that's probably the best day of my life. Can you tell that story? And I've had some good ones. I was, this is a, as if we were just talking about that. I yeah. wiped the first four holes at Royal Melbourne, um, West Course. Regular day. There's Sorry, just on that Royal Melbourne as well, where you're in it. That's the best course in Australia. So probably um, south of the equator, the best course, um, yeah. depending on who you ask. And now I've got it some mates who would disagree, but they can stuff themselves. Um, and the west course is number one. Yeah, two west courses, course yeah. and the east yeah. course. Um, so I'm on the west course today. It's a very easy start, and I've managed to wipe the first four holes, which for people who don't know, means I'm so shit, it's not worth finishing the hole. Um, yep. You just pick your ball up and walk off to the next one. And I've lost balls at this point, and I'm furious with myself i'm playing with my older brother who's sort of into golf at the time but he's um living in canberra he just wants to do something the two of us dom tyson who you might know has come yes. along so there's three of us and he's not playing great and it, the fifth hole goes this way the sixth hole comes around and you walk right past the clubhouse so i'm pretty keen to get the, like leave and i say to will um you know if you're not if, it does, if it's not if it's all the same to you like i um i i'm think i'm gonna go sell my clubs after this <laughs> hole and and that'll be that. And I hit this. I'm using a yellow ball. I've lost so many balls. I'm like, fuck yeah. Come on, I'll just use this stupid nut. And um, hit the, um, the perfect shot and it bounces and rolls in. And yeah, I mean, it was like the single moment, like the spy is like the most incredible singular moment ever. And it's up there with like the grand final siren. Like it's that. So I said that, that the, the, hole, the ball going in the hole is like the same peak as the grand final siren, except after the grand final, it stays. For a lot longer. For a lot longer. Yeah. Whereas with golf, like, you know, the next hole I probably wiped as well. So it went straight back down. But it was an unreal feeling. And yeah. I had witnesses, which is crucial. And um, on a good course too. Good course, which is, a, 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 you know, a nice thing. And I've got a little plaque that sits up in my um, in my bedroom now, which that's is awesome. a reminder. Isn't golf a bit like life? Big you know, time. Such a great up metaphor. And down. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the, you, you never know when Highs it's going to turn. It's a brilliant. You never know. Yeah, really so that's about on this. Hey, um, let's talk some footy, mate. How's sure. the year been going? Obviously, D's um, running hot. And take this, like, as a, this is a compliment. Okay? I so think I know what you're going to say, and I agree with you. Say it. Okay. Because it still rattles me how good you guys are. Like, I knew, you know, you've got such a good team, such mm -hmm. good players, but for so long, and I suppose from the start of your career yeah. too, that, uh, that connotation, that stigma of Melbourne. Yeah. And yeah. It's just, you, I can't believe you've been, like, I'm so happy you've been able to turn around, but I just, I'm still shocked. Because other clubs have probably been in that position, but just haven't been able to do it. Yeah, well, it's it's an inc incredible club story. I watched, there was a documentary that came out maybe a month ago on Fox Footy. Um, and it got, it's from the, our last premiership in 57, uh, 64, sorry, 57 years in between. And then um, the premiership we've just won. And it's, you're right, crazy. And it's baked into our, it was, like a part of our fabric where it's like we just can't get it done. Jim Stein's ran through the mark, man of the mark, and we, you know, lose. And then, you know, 2018 comes, we get pants, at, um, you know, uh, over in West Australia. And then, you know, we win the, you know, we break through, we manage to do it. And it's honestly crazy. Um, and even, you know, talking to, you know, you sort of meet people along the way, um, fans of the club, and a lot of them, we've got probably an older demographic of, uh, um, supporters and you know you get to know them a bit and then you just they just start crying like yeah. one like one day we win the grand final and the next day you see them and they're like in tears in front of you it's mental and um it's it, it would appear that we've um sort of you know for four and over it's been a good start but um i think irrespective of how we've started it's just a different uh mindset i've noticed with our fans probably more than anything so we could have you know, we could be 0-4 and, and I think that our, um, that's what you're talking about, that stigma, mm. which certainly, yeah, I mean, I noticed for the first seven years of my career, I think, um, you know, that's that monkey's off our back now. Yeah. And it's no, um, it a refreshment for our supporter base, which is awesome because they've really, really suffered through it. Yeah, no, you're so right. Like, it's now when, you, you know, you watch um, Melbourne play or I watch Melbourne play, you actually forget about yeah. what had happened. When you 100%. think of that, that how long of a heartbreak that was for supporters and it's it's – Quickly done. Now, just going back to that, sorry, you'll pick th uh, three yes. in draft. So, uh -huh. McCartan, Petrarca, Petrarca, you. Yep. So, you come into a club then. Talk us through what it was like back then. Look, it was uh, it was a really, really, in hindsight, an interesting place. Uh, for the, some of the reasons we spoke about, like um, it's not – it's it's a different club to come into than probably a lot of other clubs for that reason um, because with – I feel like 
you, you, know, you look at a guy like Jack Watts and Trengrove and Scully and like our high picks uh, have the expectation of being a high pick, but then they've also got these expectations of saving an entire football club from mediocrity. And that's an interesting dynamic to walk into. And at the time, you know, I had, I had no idea. I was none the wise. I'm just this 18 year old kid who's um, super keen to play footy and have a, you know, have a crack and get a game and things like that. I'm probably not thinking on the grand scale of things um, at that point. So might have been a bit oblivious to all that stuff. But I'd, um, Nathan Jones was a tremendous mentor uh, and he sort of helped me through the early stages of my, of my career. Paul Ruse was um, a coach who really gave me every opportunity to learn and grow and I'm very thankful for his influence early on. And yeah, I mean, I had a good first year and then... You know, started getting knocked around a bit, um, concussed and stuff. But I, I feel like I learnt a heap being in the uh, being in the Melbourne Football Club in that specific environment. It could have gone to a more successful club mm. potentially, and you know, I had it a bit easier. But I feel like I learnt so much then. And probably as a group, you look at our uh, what you might consider our core of our Premiership team. Gorney was there the whole way. Track was in my draft. Clayton was the draft after. Um, Jake Lever was in my draft, but. Um, was, he probably went to Adelaide's a different sort of path but you know Stephen May was at Gold Coast heap of mediocrity mm. up there so that's like a of all the blokes who are sort of and I'm missing I'm obviously missing people but the theme of doing it hard early learning a heap and then building on um, is something that I think has, has been really beneficial for our club yeah because it, you look now and a lot of people say like oh you need to have that experience to know how to do it. And I suppose, you know, you did have a couple of players like Jordan Lewis and whatnot that yeah, came through, yeah, absolutely. but it's not a lot that, that does it. So a lot, as you said, have come from that, um, yeah, uh, a tougher, yeah, up, yeah, you know, absolutely. tougher into 100%. it. We had, Jordan Lewis was the only premiership player, I think, um, that I ever had sort of played with and yeah. everyone else was just, you know, a Melbourne footballer who had got nowhere near it. So mm. you're right. We definitely built off that base together, which um, was good. It was, it was interesting chatting with, with Gorney when, you know, he was on the pod last time and we we're talking about when you mentioned those players before, like uh, Scully and, and Trengrove and all these guys, like Jordan Gisberts, mm. I think it was Lucas Cook. There's a lot of players, like a lot of high end talent. Yep. And he sort of put that um, not on them, but like back on, on, well, obviously on them, but also on the clubs as well at that time. And yep. it just didn't give them the best opportunity to develop. But then you look at, you know, yourself, Petrarca, um, Clayton, all of the players yep. come through now. And it's hard for you to answer because you were probably a part of it, but. Is there something in there that you go, fuck, like we've, we've had this before, but it didn't work out? Do you think they learned from the mistakes early? I think stability was the difference. And, uh, you know, people talk a lot about recruits. I, Peter Jackson for mine, who was the CEO of the year before I rocked up. Yeah. He was probably the best person that could have ever happened to our football club. He came along and hand in hand with Rusey, but Rusey gets all the plaudits and the you know recognition for bringing stability. Peter mm. Jackson was... Um, just as important, just as influential. And those two together sort of, I mean, Jonesy had like eight coaches in nine years leading yeah. up to Rusey or something crazy like that. And how can a young kid come in and perform when every different year a coach likes him or doesn't like him or wants him in this position or that position and the very, like, you know, there's no consistency, which is, you know, mm. would kill a young kid, I imagine. Mm. So for those two in particular to come in, and I, I said I was appreciative of Rusey, just as appreciative of Peter Jackson because footy club's only as good as... um you know, the, the, all the parts that make it up. And yeah. Melbourne have been historically really bad in the off-field stuff as well. So those two gave us a really solid platform um, and probably bought us time. Rusey was I can't, – someone said that. I can't remember who said he bought us time. But he really did because, you know, he takes all the pressure. He takes it all away. Um, and then we get that, as you said, those guys you mentioned, we don't really understand because we're a bit young. But we get a chance to, you know, develop and – you know, see how good we can be and grow together and um, without the sort of pressure of the external stuff, which has haunted Melbourne for ages. You're a, you're a confident guy, okay, from the out, outside. Yep. Is, that, is that the case? And if so, has it always been the case? I used to have a really crippling uh, fear of social um, public speaking and I was crazily, I, you know, I would full on lose my shit and would start sweating and stuttering and crazy. And then probably sort of as I got better at footy growing up and uh, probably you know, into my 16s and 17s, I started, inter you know, you go through the process and you start mm -hmm. interviewing with people, clubs and that. And um, I found real myself really comfortable talking about footy. And, you know, I'd be meeting these old blokes who would be asking me questions that I felt like I actually had an idea about how to answer. And 
you start, you know, with the, you know, the pretty simple stuff when you're 16, but it gets more and more and more. And by the time I was 18, I, f- I felt like that through footy and just talking about footy to different people that had, um, you know, sort of helped me overcome those issues. I am, um, yeah, I, I haven't really had a problem since I got drafted yeah. with it. And that's something that's incredible. You ask my old man who we've established off air is a bit of an idiot. He <laughs> used to um, send me into, um, you know, like a 7-Eleven to buy him a newspaper when I was a kid with like the incorrect amount of mu- like change by like a, a 20 cents, 20 cents, just to get me to in those situations to try and overcome it. And it would just, I was crippled by it, like this crippling fear of, um, you know, so talking to people, interaction, and it, I've overcome it through footy, which is incredible because you're right, now that I'm here and, geez, it's my eighth year, I feel like I've, um, yeah, certainly like it's a, it's a skill that I think you can work on being um, confident and talking to people and that sort of thing. And, it's incredible to think how far I've come. Uh, you yeah. wouldn't have known it. <laughs> Do you think that helped oh you? Looking, God, no, looking it was <laughs> the worst thing ever. I'm this, you know, ten year old kid who's like in there crying, like I'm so sorry, I don't have the right yeah. change. And then he's like, oh, here's the change, and it didn't help at all. It absolutely didn't help. In fact, it probably sent me more down. The, there's no way I'm ever talking to anyone ever. The, fu- the classic one is, um, oh, go ask that person for the time. Like he'd, or like he'd always like leave his phone in the car or something. So I'd have to go and ask someone to tell me the time. And it's like, why the fuck? I don't need to do that. Like, yeah. I'm a 10 year old kid who hates talking to people. Oh. Why are you trying to make me do that? It's, so yeah, he's an idiot. It's but. like the one when like, I don't know if any, this has happened to you as well. But when my old man used to get home, he always just call people and be like, you hey, have a chat. You know, like, yeah. I don't want to talk, talk to I don't want to talk person. to you. I don't even know who you are. I do exactly. not want to talk to I you. I have had so many bad experiences with him and trying to force me to do that stuff. <laughs> he's very, and always has been super out there and doesn't care about much of that stuff. So it's never been a problem for him, but yeah. Growing up, it was. I've overcome that ailment now, and um, here I am. I've got a podcast, and I'm on Dylan Friends. Yeah. I've made it to the big time, and nothing Don't to worry about. Rolling ones, flags, everything. Yeah, exactly. Um, hey, there is the there is a serious part to your story that's that's happened. Uh, you know, there's lots of adversity throughout your career that I, we will talk about today. But one being um, some concussion yeah. issues early in your career. Talk us through talk us through that because I think it's something that you can look at now and you can quickly forget like how serious that was for you. Absolutely. Uh, Thankfully, people do because I'm still playing and it hasn't yeah. ruined my career. And um, it's something that, you know, I've thankfully, as I said, I've got a, some so much good stuff that I've been fortunate to be able to have experienced. So it's not as big a story anymore. But you're right. I, um, you know, was pretty close there to having to throw it in. And um, my first concussion was we were at the, the real bad one where it sort of started. Like you, junior career, you have them and you sort of recover and it's fine. But... I um, was playing at Windy Hill in the VFL and it was like muddy. It had been raining all week and the centre was muddy and the ball was this cake, brick, mudded, you know, nugget basically. And I've, um, we've won the ball. I've turned to leave to blitz, run forward to um, the next contest and have just from you to me away, my teammate slid off his boot and has just smashed me in the back of the head and down and out. And I came back the week after and got another one. And then that, when you get them really close together, that's when you start, you know, with some serious sort of uh, consequences, worrying about what's going to happen um, for the next sort of couple of months. So I had maybe missed 10 games, uh, came back and had a good end to the season in my second year. And then the, th- the year after, a similar sort of couple of events, I had one big one, one big uh, concussion, and then um, another one a couple of weeks later. And then that, I missed, you know, months and was yeah i mean concussions it's crazy how i probably pay attention to it more than most people but back when i was going through that stuff five or six years ago to where it is now and the afl have got these new mandates in Mm. and there's um you know more i'd say public attention goes to the cte and the stuff that happens um if you get these repeat head knocks um yeah like that was it was um on my radar from very early on and it's it's super obviously it's super serious but like i was i've got a uni degree I'm studying and um, and my parents, as much as I just have, you know, slagged off my old man, mm. he's been great to, you know, footy's awesome and if you can make as, get as much out of it as you can, but you've got to, if you finish, let's say you finish at 30, you've got 50 years of, you know, life, let's say, to live and what are you going to be doing with that? So um, my brain's super important to me and I was yeah, probably prepared to give the game away at, at a certain point, but... Um, feel super comfortable what used mm. just about every single resource available to me and there was a lot of great people that helped out and thankfully yeah now here i am um wearing a helmet playing footy and doing all right with it all so it's um yeah it's crazy how close to think now yeah looking back on it i was 
prepared to give it away just yeah. to you know, protect the rest of my life. Yeah. Well, it's a credit to you. And I think that it's something that a lot of young males and females need to know that there is more to life than playing footy. But what were, what were some of the things you did to get your brain back on track? So we've had Paddy McCartan on the show a couple of times. Yeah. You know, he did, you know, he was sort of detailing a few things that he went through as well. And I know, you know, it's, you don't compare concussions because they're all yeah, completely they're different. All super individual. They're all super individual and they yep. still work it out. But was there something for you that you did? Was it like training your brain again? Like, do, yeah, we did um, neurophysiotherapy was the one for me where it was great. Like, you know, you get exercise, you get a sore shoulder, you do your um, rotations, mm-hmm. whatever. But I, and I'm sure that <clears throat> people having a concussion, serious concussion now, would this would be something that would be mu- much more widely available. We had to, you know, sort of know like 10 different sort of people to get to this p- uh, lady, Katie, her name was. And like I was doing a um, heap of different exercises and like I'd be getting splitting headaches afterwards and then I'd have to stop. And then, you know, you just try and build and build and build. And I feel like that helped. I, um, had this I- extensive series of tests done um, with this lady, Tracy, who's a neuro something, another neuro something, um, as opposed to, you know, the scat test, if you've ever been concussed, it's like, I uh, remember five words, I could probably like elbow carpet, saddle, bubble, elbow, something stupid like that. Like you can remember them now. Um, and so we went into a heap more depth there um, to profile, you know, my brain function and stuff. And then look, I said, and, and people who get concussed, I, you know, through the AFL, um, I've spoken to a few times and the thing that I say is, um, you know, you might not, you might not be ever feeling right and ready to go again. Mm. And that could very, very well be your reality. And, um, you've got to be able to accept that because, um, as, as we spoke about, you know, there's so much more to life than footy and it's hard to tell that to some people and some people might not feel that as strongly as I do and that's fine, but that's, you know, what I believe. And, um, I got to, it got to a point for me where I just felt like, I was uh, ready to go, and it was a, it was a, it was a subtle shift. I had one day where I was a really bad day at training, where a ball sort of flew by my head and nearly hit me, and I was like, "Oh, geez!" Like, and felt super anxious about it, and was like, "Oh, like I'm not ready, I'm not ready." And that was like a really like far out like moment for me, and I was sort of like a bit shaken up by that. And then doing my rehab, there was a few like I'd, you sort of introduced to contact and a few bit knocks and bumps and stuff, and then maybe a couple of months later, another ball whizzed past my head. And that feeling that I felt just wasn't there. And mm. I was like, sort of right in it. And I felt good. And I'm on to the next contest sort of thing. And I reflected on that moment. I was like, geez, like that's, um, like I'm, uh, that, that, look how far I've come. And it was a feeling that's hard to put into words, but like I just knew. And I'm like, all right, well, I'm, I'm ready to go now. And, um, you can't, there's nothing you can do to fast track that. I think everyone yeah. gets there in their own time. But it's, I was very fortunate to get there. So from what, from what you've said then, it sounds like you, probably lost a little bit of confidence just in your body of, of, at that time. Yeah, yeah. Was it just time that got it back or was there other things that you were doing at that time? Like, you know, nowadays um, this stuff's heavily done, but back when you were doing, as you said, it was a bit foreign. Like, were you just doing like mindfulness, visualisation? Yeah. Like, was anyone you were seeing, like a psychologist yep. to even get you back into it? Like, how'd you get your confidence back? Yeah, so Dave Williams um, was my psych at the time. He's now at Geelong. And, uh, yeah, I was seeing him, you know, Every day, just about. I was in at the club, and we were talking through all this stuff. He was terrific, um, and yeah, like you know, the doctors, the club doctors were awesome. Um, doctor, uh, it's funny. Uh, you might have, might have seen the news. Z, uh, the club doctor, the old club doctor at Melbourne. They've he's been in the media a bit. Uh, the club and him and um, our old president and all that stuff's been blowing up. But I found him only um, really, really conservative with this stuff. So like, my head it was the number one priority and. Um, I was really thankful for that. Um, so I had this, be- uh, this beautiful network of people around me who was supporting and helping um, from a symptom point of view. That when once they cleared mm-hmm. up, it was probably a month between where I was feeling mentally um, ready to go and when my symptoms disappeared. And that space in between, what you spoke about with the visualization, the mindfulness, and all the, the mental skills type of stuff, um, yeah, I was working on pretty much constantly. So. There's no, uh, and as we, we said, there's no one size fits all sort of yeah. recovery treatment thing. But um, yeah, I, I, I took a holistic approach to it and it, it really was beneficial for me. And I'm probably, you know, in a weird way, better for the experience because I'm, um, you know, upskilled in so many areas that I, I wouldn't have had to if I didn't go yeah. through that well, stuff. And perspective, so, I suppose, as well. Yeah, like, perspective yeah. is awesome as well, yeah. which you can't teach as well. Um, nah, so look, I'm here now and touch wood. 
no more concussion issues. But yeah. I've had big head knocks, big bumps and stuff, and have just got up and run around. And big, big bumps, too. Yeah, it's hard to miss. And yeah. um, people, you know, <laughs> people laugh about that, but that's yeah. a serious thing. Like, yeah. it gets in the way sometimes. And <laughs> and I'd be super if, – if it happened, then I felt like – if I felt like shit, I'd just – yeah, you know, I'd be. I'm, I'm course, really yeah. honest with that stuff. But I'm just like it just doesn't happen to me. Nah, anymore, it's fantastic. So it's good. It's a good story. Good. Let's get back to some um, some other stuff that's been having very good 2021 season. Days in the flag. Yep, it's pretty good. Taking back to the start of the year, like yeah. was it was a belief there? Like was it? The, I'm sorry. I suppose it was like bubbling. Mm. But was it there? Did you think this could actually happen? Uh so I think probably the belief cemented itself after we played Richmond in round six for Jonesy's 300th and my 100th game. And there's a huge build-up for Jones's game. Like, he's the 300, um, three, joined the 300 club. And, uh, you know, Anzac Eve's a huge occasion. And Richmond are the, this juggernaut. And uh, we beat them and we're 6-0. and And I think that game was when it was like... And everyone always has belief. It's always everyone's year and we're always running on top of the ground going into round one, that sort of thing. But after we won that game, I feel like that was when it was like, okay, like this is um, this is pretty serious now. Like we're going and we've just knocked off the best team in the last five years. Yeah. And that's when I feel like the belief really just skyrocketed. Because you, I think you guys won... Was it... Forgive, forgive, uh, how many in a row it was? Was it like... Nine, I think. Nine in a row. Yeah. And then there was a little bit of a... Yep, down. Did. Yep, we lost a couple, and then probably ones we should have won. We lost to Adelaide and Adelaide, and I can't remember the other one. But the big one again then <coughs> uh, was the one in Geelong, where that was sick. I'm sure you spoke to Gorney about. I that. did speak to Gorney. Actually, no, I don't. I think we might have had him on. No. We spoke to him after uh, at the the best and fairest episode, but when I had yeah. the actual episode with him, I don't think that game had happened yet. So well, you were in a little bit of a slump at that stage. Yeah, so very. And we yeah. had been pants. We had kicked like seven goals in. Ten, five minutes of footy and um you know we sort of uh we were going to play finals so it wasn't like we were just like we we knew we were going to play finals we weren't trying to win the game we were like we've got to get our you know our yeah. brand back and our game back and um you know show some positive signs before we play finals next week and then one thing leads to another and Gorney kicks the most you know crazy goal because it could have literally gone anywhere he's got the worst history I, but, with Geelong but that's the thing as well is like Geelong also, GMHPA Stadium, yeah. like, you know, the infamous Skilled Stadium, I think, is nearly the biggest win of all time against you and yeah, the Cats. Of course. So there's like that. There's Gorn, you know. Uh, yeah, there's Scouts history galore. There's Look a, back at Gorn's last four years and he's missed like 10 goals against there's them to a lot win the game. There. So I personally, from an outsider perspective, I was like, holy fuck, this is. Yeah, man. The, the things are changing. It was um, crazy. There. Then um, the lead up to the game in Perth, obviously, COVID mm. over there. Do you remember. Uh, like the lead up to those games well because I think you know yeah, I was I speaking to, to Clayton about this as well but I don't think he really remembered much but there was a part <laughs> where I was thinking this is a little bit dangerous 21 days off yep. I think it was um, between finals yeah yeah I was like, Fuck, that's a long time to not I be playing we played, we played the qualifying final and then had two weeks off and then the prelim and then another two weeks off so we played two games in a month basically yeah. um and yeah, I remember it. Look, I, uh, as we spoke about briefly before, had this uni degree that I'm doing and was... What uni is it, by the way? What are you doing? Uh, Monash. I'm at Monash Uni and I've got one unit left in a f- commerce degree, majoring in finance, which is um, exciting. super exciting. Yeah. I can't wait to be finished. It's my ninth year of uni, wow. so I'm sick of it. We'll but talk about that another time. Nah, forget <laughs> it. If anyone wants to talk finance, then do not come to me. I'm yeah. so sick yeah, of it. We'll take but that chat off air. That could, get, that could get really... Uh, but I had so much to do at the time. So yeah. I was flat out with that. I've got a lot of family in Perth as well. So once we were able to get let out, so we were free basically uh, for the two weeks leading up to the grand final. I had a lot of people to catch up and see. And so I was I was adequately busy and golf. We were on a golf course as well. Mm. But, um, you know, geez, there were some people who really, really struggled because you essentially we were caged in for like six weeks uh, at this Joondalup resort and with not much to do. So, um you know, you see there's a spectrum of blokes. Some re- do really well and then there's others who sort of struggle mm. and I think we balance that really well, um, the coaches and the, um, you know, footy managers and stuff um, so that we could cater for all people because, you know, if Clary said he can't remember much and was struggling, well, he's, you know, arguably one of the most important players on yeah. the ground when the grand finals sort of, um, the whips are cracking there. So we need, obviously, everyone to sort of um, get get the job done. And um, that hub was, I, I enjoyed it. I really, you know, had a great time because you've locked in with you. 
I, you know, we have a great group of guys and we get along all really well. And, um, and look, it probably helps that we won because it's like the positive sort yeah. of, it's great end of the story, makes it all um, worthwhile. But uh, yeah, I thought it was, um, you know, a unique experience. Mm. What, what are you like heading into a grand final though in, you know, performance wise? Like, are you... I was late to the grand final thing, which was um, not great. You were late to the... The, the grand final meeting night before our um, pre-game team meeting. So I... Um, my thing was, it's just another game, really, yeah. and I'm just going to disengage. And I've got my brothers here, so I'm just going to go hang out with them all day, and I'm just going to forget about footy, and it's going to be sweet. And I did a great job of that, and too I probably well. did too good a <laughs> job because then, like, we're sort of ten minutes away from June up, and I'm like, I get a call from Jake Melsham. I'm like, hey man, what's going on? And he's like, where the hell are you? And I was like, oh, what do you mean? And he's like, yeah, we're in a meeting. I was like, Fuck, that sucks. I've f- yeah, forgotten that. Forgotten that we so had. A you meeting, weren't just so. like. A little bit late. You were talking like uh, five. I was five mi- ten minutes late. Um, but it th- almost doesn't matter how late. If you were one minute late, yeah, then you're one minute late. Um, and we had this awesome thing where awesome thing. We had this uh, it was driven from that the leadership group where if someone was late, didn't matter what for, you would all have to do a two minute plank as punishment. And we get in there, and it's just like the most painful experience and then like we all sort of have a laugh and it's all right time to plank and sort of cut the attention a little yeah. bit i like to think that i cut the tension and on grand final day when we were in the change rooms i was like don't worry goody like i'm here now mate we can start the meeting and everyone had a laugh so i um i tell you what if we had a lost i would have been crucified yeah. i would have yeah. been absolutely crucified so i'm it's, very glad maybe that's why i played all right and i was like you can't cannot let this 100 percent. it's like you have to um sometimes it is good to break the air like that but i can imagine if you know, like yourself or Goody didn't take it well. It could actually fully fuck the Goody vibe. Goody was awesome, yeah. yeah. Goody was awesome with it. I, look, he, I'm sure he would have been aware of that as well. Yeah. And like, what do you know? There's no, there's no way you'd let that derail you. It's not no. like I've done anything. Like, I've not murdered anyone or anything. So yeah. it's not like a totally fatal error, but it's this, just... This story could be like so wrong, but I've heard of this story and I, it's, it's a shocking story because I don't know who it was or where it was, but I've heard that there was a game and, um, and I don't really like talking about uh, fluctuance or anything like that, but there was a game and it was a grand final when a team was down going into the third quarter mm. and a player, they were doing like a really, really serious like speech going into the third quarter. Like, we need to get back. We need to get back. And a player like farted <laughs> at like the worst time. And apparently like it just fucked like the whole yeah. like vibe of the speech. And like guys oh, didn't yeah. know whether to laugh or to be like, what the fuck? And the coach was just rattled. Yeah. And then like they lost the grand final. Sure. I, I don't know if that's that a wasn't true our story. Grand, that certainly no. wasn't our grand final, but you can. It's a weird energy. In yeah, the, in the, that's when we were down as well at the halftime, and I can only imagine because there'd be blokes a hundred percent. Christian Matraka couldn't help himself; he would laugh. Yeah, and then there'd be blokes like Jack Lever would not laugh, and you're right, that sort of weird energy. Yeah. We didn't have anything like that. Thank God, we'd already you know got that all out of the way last yeah. night, the night yeah. before. But um, no, nah, it was um. The lead up was sweet. I had um, a heap of support. I think a lot, the majority of people over there were Melbourne sort of inclined for yeah. whatever reason. So we um, had the support of the crowds and you know, we got yeah. a bit of freedom at the end of it towards it as well. So it was all, and it was an unbelievable sort of month of my life. Yeah. Let's talk about the game though. I love grand finals. I, I really say this seriously. I actually don't watch a lot of footy anymore because mm. I just, for some reason, I, I don't know, I just don't watch a lot of footy, but I love finals Yeah, because it's a different game. It's a it completely different game. It's just like... Well, it's do or die, really. If you don't win, you're you're out. And I think that it obviously just adds a lot to it. Everyone loves finals. And even more on a a grand final level, um, what are your memories of the game? Does anything stand out? And I love talking about like those, as you would always know this, um, being in in football, um, is like, you know those moments in games that are spoken about, you know, on the broadcast that are big moments. But then there's also one internally that might have happened that no one would know about. Uh Uh-huh. Do any sort of things stick out to you that have happened in that game? Yeah, I um, I'm probably I'm probably with you a little bit. Like I, I you know, my life so much revolves around footy. I, you know, I watch my brothers play, and a few if that's a big game, I watch. But mm. I, you know, um, don't watch a heap other outside of that. But well, I reckon it was an awesome game. Obviously, we won, but the back and forth. Um, you know, we are up at quarter time. Then Bontempelli and um, you know, they they fire up and. Then they're in front, and then it's back and forth. That third quarter's nuts, and then we just have the most insane last quarter. Mm. Um, we spoke about Jordan Lewis. He um, gave uh, the midfield group some advice. Essentially, you know, just take it all in. There was a few points, and I was like, I'm just going to take it all in and just enjoy it. Um, try not to get so wound up about it because, you know, it's an incredible opportunity and um, a, a privilege. I love watching, as you said, grand finals are awesome. Um, so I've, you know, I watch all the videos that come out after, and the storylines are awesome. So I'm taking it all in. I remember um, 
so my grandparents uh, came up to the game like three hours early for the prelim final. They nearly missed it because they're a bit old and frail and um, the train the trains were just packed. So they got in there about three and a half hours before the game started. So I knew where they were in the stand. I could, I grant my grandma's a lunatic um, and I could see her waving her flag around. I was like, that's my grandma. And I'm like, so I got them all tickets. So I know they're sitting somewhere. Yeah. So I'm the, uh, the, the anthem's going and I'm sort of looking up at them in that moment when the, um, anthem finishes and the um crowd roars like that's that's one moment that's just like you can't replicate which is mm. incredible um and then yeah i think um you're talking about moments that people uh you know might talk about from the Record, game yeah yeah i think um swing the game because i know there was that tight moment that you were sort of alluding to then like yeah where it could have gone either way well i think they kicked like the first two goals after half time but and we were down by 19 points but it had taken them like uh, I'd say nearly 15, 16 minutes to do it. Mm. So a heap mm. of time of us just getting smashed in the back line and, um, you know, contest after contest and our uh, defenders stood up really well. But there was um, a James Harms kick to Bailey Fritch and like the game had been the third, the third quarter, which is what we were trying to do is just make it a slog, like a, just an absolute um, just contest after contest type of affair, like a really ugly brand of football, just to slow it all down and hopefully outlast them over the course of the next you know quarter and a half. And he got this, it just sat up for him and he just plucked it out of the air and hit this, it was like the most perfect kick ever. And if you just look at everything else, it's just been so like bogged down mm. and contest and just hacked out. And he got this one bit of fresh air and just laced Fritter out. And Fritter's taken an uncontested mark because it's the most perfect kick ever. And then he goes back and slots that goal. Um, and then we start rolling a bit. And then there's a few other moments. But I remember seeing that and thinking, geez, like this has been, we've been flat out yeah. for like 15 minutes and we're all gassed. And then Harms, he's just got this one little moment, shining moment of glory where he's just laced out Fritter. So I think that was one moment where, you know, for me personally, I was like, thank Christ, like we've been under the pump here. And now we've sort of got, got one off. And um, from there, yeah, it just started rolling and yeah. um, didn't stop. I must say as well, and, and you're a humble man, so it might embarrass you, but that your third quarter was unbelievable. I just remember you just settled. It was really settled. And as you said, I remember that, like those games are high tempo and mm. things going on, but you just had it and you were just hitting targets, taking marks, sort of slowing the game down, but also making it fast, but hitting targets. Yeah. And it's funny it was that huge. Like, I appreciate the kind words. Yeah. Uh, Lingers and I, Ed Langdon, we're in the part of the Wingers Club. Yeah. And quite often it's. Um, you know, you feast or famine. And if the ball's on your side, you're having a great time. Yeah. If it's not, you're just not doing much. And it felt like, and probably was the reality of that third quarter was, it was just bogged down on my half of the ground. And so naturally it was just in a heap more of the play. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, far out. I've been, I've been playing footy for 20 odd years. Well, how am I, 26? Yeah, 20 years. And, you know, you trained and dream of these sort of occasions and moments. And I felt like... Um, yeah, I was in in that, and I was absolutely buggered as well yeah. in that third quarter. And I was just like, "Well, this could be your only chance." You hear stories of guys who you know get nowhere near finals or grand finals, and I was like, "Well, I'm just gonna have a crack." And I felt like uh, yeah. that was what that was. That's how I, that was my mentality. That's what I did. And um, you know, thank God we won. Like it just would have been so depressing if we lost and we didn't. Yeah, no, I can I can imagine it wouldn't be. It's probably the opposite of what. Yeah, felt and I feel good. so bad because the other side of that coin and the, the doggies guys have to go through that. But yeah, um, I'm very thankful it wasn't me. Yeah, how good though to have. You know, you've played a lot of good games, but how good to have a good game on that day. Like you must sit back and go, like we won the flag, but also I contributed. Yeah, like, I mean, I would ease and let's get the record very straight <laughs> right now. If you said to me, Angus, you'll not touch the ball a single time and you'll run around and get nowhere near it, but you'll still win a flag. I'd take that. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, it's um, it's just a like it's uh, it's just an awesome feeling to yeah. to have experienced. And you're right, like when um, it was you know when the whips were cracking and it was hard. Like I felt like um, and all my teammates. Well, we were all we all played a part. You look across the board, everyone contributed, and I did my part. And I feel like um, that's a really satisfying feeling to be a part yeah. of a team and have success. From where we started, we spoke about with absolutely none of it to have built um. Yeah, and to be a part of that, it feels really special. So I'm yeah. very, very thankful. Oh, it's exciting. Plenty more to come. I don't know if you listen to list vloggers, but I made a very big statement on that. What'd you say? I, I said Melbourne are going to be good for a very long time. <laughs> it was it was <laughs> quite ground, it was quite groundbreaking. Everyone loved it. Yeah, um, great. Yeah, it was really exciting. Um, before we move on to another topic, just on on D's since that, what's been 
you know, and, and I'm sure that, and it's obviously it hasn't happened with being four zip, but I'm sure there's always a conversation about going, all right, we've won one, but we want mm. another one. And we yeah. want to win in Melbourne at the MCG. Yep, that's huge. Um, and look, we've got... Uh, a great a great bunch of blokes but the worry that everyone i felt had and i certainly felt was like um are we just gonna be happy with one and you find out pretty quickly when boys come back for their um time trials and skinnies and stuff um how the, how everyone's attitude is towards that what mm. you're talking about and um i think we had like 30 pbs on the on the time trial front in the first yeah. month and everyone's in ripping nick and you're absolutely right i think that thing that you know our, the majority of our supporters are here and I mean, the majority of them weren't able to get over to watch the game because of all the border stuff. So it's a super um, powerful motivator to have so many people back here uh-huh. who um, are so keen to see us do well and succeed. And you're right, we're four and I, I don't actually think we've been playing that well. We're just sort of just going and I feel like um, there's some more levels for us to, in terms of game style where... Um, we can sort of elevate. We're defending really well, which is the core of our sort of game. But, um, you know, it's exciting. Like, we've got so much room for growth and development and, um, you know, we're doing – we're winning games. So, um, it's an exciting time and place. At the same time, we're super aware that these things very, very quickly can change and trying to stay grounded and in the moment mm. not get too far ahead of ourselves, love which it. I think we're doing a good job of. Good answer. Yeah. Good answer. I love Cozzy Pickett too. I don't, we don't He's know. unreal. Yeah, I don't have to talk about too much, but geez, I'd love that bloke. And I love Luke Jackson too. Like Dogger? Got some, yeah. So they live with my parents. They um. Oh, wow. So four brothers, three of them now live in West Australia. Well, they lived in like your old rooms and stuff, yeah, don't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. Mum and dad, mum's sentimental about the family house. Don't yeah. want to sell it. And, yeah. um, you know, there's four empty rooms. I think she, again, my old man, Idiot, and if you're in a house with him, one out, like he probably needs some social filler yeah, in between. Yeah, so your mum just needs so some. So mum's like, yeah. bring them all in, and yeah, we've got yeah. like three blokes in there at the moment. So who's in there at the moment? Um, Disco Turner, uh, Jard McVee, and Tajwo Woden. So they like get the young draftees yep. in, and um, so Sticks played footy, uh, and mum moved over with him. He played for North, thirty two odd games yep. or something like that. So they've got experience with um, you know playing games, not playing games, and uh, they've had. You know, I've seen just about everything with four boys growing up. So they um they love it and they get so super involved in the club. There's an awesome photo that's framed now at Mum and Dad's house of um the two of them with all the blokes who so Clayton Oliver lived with them. I live with them. Luke yep. Jackson, Cosy Pickett, Trent Rivers. There might be one other I'm missing, but the, the, all of us who had lived there and were oh, in the Premiership yeah, team awesome. and they're there because um my mum's father, late father now, was uh, ill at the time and they were over there um to provide him the care stuff so they got an exemption across the border but so they were there for the grand final oh nice and i actually took the cup to see him the day after we uh, a couple of days after we won and he had it was an awesome experience to do that but um yeah that photo sits up in mum and dad's house now and um yeah i think as long as uh you know they've still got that house which seems likely they'll just be you know getting people in there and and loving it yeah Yeah, it's awesome Love it. Hey, you have to ask as well you um we're on afl 360 for just about five minutes just for five minutes was it no we are Oh, we are. No, we are now. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah we're on. We're G'day, on. guys. Yeah, yeah. So, talk us through. Uh, you're a big free agent this year. Yeah, cheers, Robbo. Yeah, yeah. Robbo Herald son. <laughs> Tell me how that is going for you at the moment. Is it? Is there anything fired up with that yet? Footy clubs are, are you know, big sort of machines, and mm. they don't. It's not just one person, but yet we've got this culture of media where it's like, what's this? And Luke Jackson's another one. Like, what's Dogger gonna do? Dogger's got. He's got no idea, I'm telling you, about yeah. what's going on in the world, let alone what he's doing um, <laughs> with his contract. So it's this weird fixation, which I think is um, funny. But, um, you know, we spoke about, um, you know, I've been fortunate to be, I've played some good games and um, that sort of, you know, makes the reality a little bit kinder to me. If mm. I was, um, as we spoke about, I'd, I've taken the zero touch grand final medal mm. and, you know, I'm happy to play my role for the team. I love doing it. But, um, you know, it's the... It's a big decision, and yeah. I feel like, um, you know, Dog is going to be all right. He's going to be okay. Like, uh, there was a joke. He actually, he's got a manager, so yeah. he's, he's going to be okay. But, um, you know, I'm just, I love, I love my teammates at Melbourne, yeah. um, and I love playing football for this club. And it's, it's just an interesting thing. People get so wound up about it, and, yeah. um, you know, the decision will happen when it happens. I, you know, I have no idea what it's going to be at the moment. Yep. Yeah. Um, but I'm very much enjoying playing footy at the moment. Yeah. And I love my teammates, and as I said, and the rest will take care of itself. You play footy, 
the old cliche, you play good footy, everything will take care of itself. Yeah, seems to yeah. be seems to ring never true. Never quite happened for me, unfortunately. <laughs> um, never, never, never got to find out if that's actually true or not. But I'll live that one mm. through you. But uh, good right. luck with that. You should get Dogger on the podcast. I by will. Way. Yeah, yeah. He, we got him on our one, and he was t- talking to us about um, plan. I was like, "What do you do in your spare time?" And he he um, looks at planets that might have potential habitable planets. Oh, I love that shit. So yeah, um, we're talking about Luke Jackson, aren't we? Yeah, Luke yeah. Jackson, Dogger. Yeah, um, that's a good nickname. And I, he'd, uh, I'm not sure he's the one to take us to space, but he's he's looking. So okay, good, good. So he's more of a yeah, like experimental funny. guy. Um, personal life. Yep. Love to talk about your beautiful partner. Ticking along, Danielle. Danielle. It's her birthday week now. Happy birthday, Danielle. Happy birthday week to you, Danielle. Yep. So she's um, started red hot. and um, It's funny with the partners. They love a birthday week, oh, yeah. don't they? It's just, it just doesn't end Let with the one. Let the record one. show. I, I also love the birthday week, Danielle, if yeah. you're listening. So the, don't the, change yeah. any of that. And can you talk about a present? Like the pot will be out on you know yep. Monday, so... So yeah. I've she's um, gonna have it by then. Yeah, she'll have it by then. Yeah, I I've got her. So it's like um, she likes loves drinking wine and alcohol and things of that nature. And a safe like a like real safe sort of gift is like a like a Riedel, like sort of a nice stemware glass that because um, her mum drinks wine, nice wine as well. So they're a wine family. And so I've gone wine glasses historically, like some nice wine glasses. And are they the big big, big ones? Because I'm sp- carrying on. Yeah, yeah, yeah you've yeah. got to have the big, the big ones. ticket so items. So like every restaurant does and I go to, yep. it ha- if it doesn't have those wine, like you just you walk out. Forget them. Yeah. Forget them. So I've gone historically big with them, but I'm sort of running out of, we've got all the, gla- we live together and yep. our cupboards are stocked with this stupid glassware that <clears throat> I've bought and um, I'm I'm thinking that and I, it, I've, I've, I've placed the order. I'm going to pick it up tomorrow, but I'm not, I could change my mind still there. Martin, so she likes margaritas uh, and yeah. there's like this mar- margarita martini sort of um, stem glass for nice. four of them that I'm thinking of getting, but she's sort of dropped a few other hints. She wants some, um, she steals my uh, clothes. I'm sure everyone goes through yeah. this, but she there's one jumper in particular, this big Nike puffer jacket that she steals. I'm thinking I could get her one of those, but I'm, 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 I think I'm going to lock awesome. martini glasses Doing in. Doing friends stuff. Yeah, yeah like, well, oh, she'd, can, don't worry, she'd steal I that. I send her some you know for her birthday. Yeah. Sounds, you know, sounds like we'd be friends. I love margaritas. Oh, margaritas are great, but um, it apparently Extra makes salt. a difference what you drink them out of. Oh, so I'm, no, um, I, I agree with that. I'm going for the high-end margarita glasses. I'm locking that in. So I'm, um, I hope she likes them. I think and, she will. And how did you guys, I know there's an understand there's a pretty crazy story about how you, you guys met because yep. friends and, and Danielle's father's obviously Danny yep. Frawley, um, absolute superstar of our game. Yep. How did you guys meet? So it's a great story for her. Um, for her, not yeah, for you. It's a feel-good story. <laughs> yeah. We um, So my old man was the CEO of Richmond when he was the coach and there's this classic photo of the two of us I um, mean, like the crash, like the, you know, childcare when um, the games are on, we're too young to go. So, you know, she's been chasing me ever since <laughs> and um, finally got there after 20 years. So it's um, good on her. Good on her. No. Yeah. So that's obviously a joke. We um, had that. We went to Halebury together, went through school. I was the year above her, but, you know, we were always just mates and, you know, you're not really, I'm a you know, 13, 14 year old kid at the time, probably not too worried about who my partner's going to be and, you know, just sort of figuring out what's going on in life at the time and um, finished school and then we sort of, you know, go out separate ways and we actually sort of got to back together. <clears throat> Old Halebury, uh, the football club, I've got a few mates there and there's a, and Spud um, sort of, he's, so she's one of three girls and they were all sort of um, into the footy stuff and they started the Old Halebury girls footy team and um, yeah, we just sort of bumped in. At a post game function, and um, geez, that's nearly three years. That would be more than three years ago now. So we've, um, yeah, been uh, going strong for it's coming up on three years. But we sort of been, you know, how, how it goes before that. We're just talking and all that stuff. Yeah. So it's been three good years. Yeah, it's an incredible love story, isn't it? She's, um, you know, feel good story. I'm sure they'll do a movie or something about yeah. it. Yeah, oh, well, you never know. Um, Rom-com. and and uh, not to to miss on a you know massive part of the story, uh, the the impact you know Spud. Would yeah. have on you and, and not just, you know, footy, but yep. everything else. Can you talk us a bit about that? And obviously, I've, I've asked you about this off-air to yeah, make sure yeah, you're happy yeah. about talking about this. Well, I think what's been incredible is the work that the girls have done. So, mm. the, the Danny Frawley Centre is now open. Um, Chelsea, the older sister, has been a huge part of that. She works at St Kilda. So, they've been massive advocates in the mental health space and, you know, the, the total, they talk about holistic health um, down there. And, you know, it's incredible to watch all the pain and stuff that they've gone through that for something like this to come out the other end of it. And, um, you know, that's super inspiring. and I'm super proud of all of them. But, they, you know, they, they, they love talking about mental health and trying to make a difference. And so, you know, I'm, I'm glad you've asked because yeah. uh, that's one of Spud's legacies. It would be yeah. a waste if 
you know, people um, didn't take something out of his passing. And this is one of them. So the mental health stuff, yeah, I mean, he... I've sort of known him as we sort of touched on for 20-odd years and <clears throat> maybe not intimately for the first 15, but you sort of uh, see the stories and you hear the reports of the, um, you know, the mental health stuff. And thankfully, like, this is... is this is my first real experience with it. Obviously, it's been three or so years now. But when we started going out, it was, um, you know, he was still alive and to watch um, how it sort of impacted their family and um, Danielle in particular, obviously, as my girlfriend, uh, it was it was incredibly, incredibly hard to watch without knowing what much much of what to do. And I think the AFL is good with that stuff. They try and educate and it's... Um, you know, well-intentioned, but I, f- I found certainly when I was in there, in the thick of it, that it was just like, wow, like I, um, I've, you know, I'm really, str- I don't know what to do here. What do I, do? you know, how do I, what do I say to my girlfriend whose old man's on these ups and downs? And um, it was a, a really hard time for, for not just me, obviously, but, um, you know, their, their whole family. And, you know, there's no easy answer. <clears throat> I don't, I, that's not a surprise, um, but... I found I'm, I'm so inspired by the way they, um, you know, stuck together as a family and they are such a loving, caring group of people. And um, obviously people know how the story ends um, with Spud, but um, again, super proud of how incredibly proud, like that's not even the word doesn't come, yeah. to come close to describing the stuff that's happened afterwards. I think it's an appropriate legacy because he was an incredible man and, um, for the stuff that's come since the wellness center, the um, awareness that he's raised off the back of it, which is hard. Um, it's hard to get that. I mean, it's hard for the girls like, you know, to say like, geez, like it's so much good has come from it. Yeah. They've lost their father and husband, but I think, um, you know, it was, uh, I'm, I'm so proud of how they've shifted it and tried to make it into as much of a positive as they can. So um, yeah, it's, uh, and I think now, and even now since like reflecting personally, I am, um, have I, I just feel like I'm so much more well skilled like the Danny Frawley Centre is just open but like the, the lessons that they're trying to teach I've been learning from the Frawley girls for the last couple of years and I feel like now I'm so much better equipped to help my mates and people at the footy club and um, you know we spoke about perspective before and I feel like I've got this whole new perspective on life that um, you know as the mental health stuff becomes more and more um prevalent and people are more and more prepared to talk about it. I think that's a, that's a, as a result of this collective um, social shift, which is, you know, blokes like Spud have, you know, most to, to say about that. It's been, um, it's, yeah, it's an incredible story, but um, it's not over yet. And um, the Spud Frawley Front Centre is open for anyone who wants to get down there. I mean, it's um, a space for people to come and just, you know, help working in holistic health. And, um, you know, I'd encourage, even if it like, you know, you can just ask a mate, how are you going? And that's something that I wasn't really able to do until you know i learned off the frawley girls mm. um i'm so much better for knowing them and for that da- knowing danielle and if she listens to this then um yeah i mean it's inspiring so uh yeah good on them all it is mate well said um i don't yeah like you said then i don't think there is there is no there's nothing to say yeah. that will, will make anything um in better in this situation but i think from from an onlooker and someone who's watched and uh, partaken and admired the way the family's gone about it it's nothing short of inspirational yeah and, they're and just yeah. incredibly sh- people say you know there's such a strong person and whatever and all that stuff it doesn't come close to describing the strength that those girls have uh, yeah. shown in you know very easy for that to just you know just write everything off and forget about it but it's inspiring it is let's uh let's maybe you know this year i, I really want to get to around to the, the spuds game and yeah Get around it. Um, I know, you know, last year's been hard with COVID and everything, mm. but yeah, what an inspirational man and, and an inspirational family. And Absolutely. It's, uh, it's an honour to even, you know, talk about it in conversation. So do everything we can there. The girls are doing incredible things and there's plenty, plenty, plenty more to come in that space. And um, yeah, we had Jack Steele on as well, who was talking yep. about the the, um, the wellness centre they got out at St Kilda too, yep. which is which has been a massive hit and, and doing incredible things. So as you said, story's not, uh, not, forgotten at all and and um and still to this day living on doing 100%. awesome stuff yeah it's awesome awesome so stuff good on them hey um your brother's been on the show before you which one andy yep fair and enough. he's in some good form he's a good player we were talking about him earlier like um I'd you know what you guys have go on like a really thick head of hair oh yeah god yeah so my part who uh, you know has passed away but was 88 
It's the thickest head of hair I've ever seen. And white. The whole way through, he had a full head of hair till his last days and thick. And yeah. I, it feels good, to be honest, because... <laughs> oh, I, I, I can imagine. I wouldn't know. Um, so Andrew and I have the thick hair. Hamish and William are the two brothers, less thick. And Sticks, again, a loser, but he's going <laughs> bald. He's balding aggressively. Yeah. So um, I think so that's yeah, what the other two that, brothers, are they a chance they've got, to... They've got the horns going oh, back, no, so it's coming for them. Yeah. And it just feels really... Really good. It's just not something. I, it's just not something I'm going to have to worry about. So it's um. You could head of genuinely hair. donate some of your hairline to like me. I'm going to yeah, like, easily. You, if anything, you I've might got a three head. You know the joke. Yeah, with a five head, I've got a three head. Probably Literally, you better give one of your heads to mine because I've got the five head. We then we'd both have four. Somewhere heads. in the middle would be somewhere yeah. that'd be good. But no, look, it, it's um a thick head of hair. Andrew yeah. has one as well. He is playing good footy. Sorry, back to Andrew. Playing, yeah, <laughs> sorry, back to him playing footy. He's playing fantastic. Yeah, we were talking um, yeah. You know, you don't want to wish injuries on anyone, but Fife being injured, I think, has given him yeah more scope to work. And they've traded Chera to Carlton, so he's got a heap more responsibility and seems to be really flourishing. So mm. um, I think they're in the top four as well. So playing good footy in a winning side is um, I know he's loving that. Does he love Perth? Does he love WA? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm a West Australian, so is my older brother, and Andrew and Hamish are born in South Australia, and we've got yeah. a heap of family sort of over west. So when did you because. Not to go all the way back to the still. I thought you were from Sandy Dragons. Yeah, I'm a Sandy so, Dragon. I moved. We moved pretty early. But, oh right. Um, all yeah. our family, mum and dad are West Australians as well. Right. Their f- grandparents and um, aunties and uncles and all that stuff live there. So yeah, they've um, gone over and found the transition really easy. Yeah, um, cool. I'd be surprised, very surprised, just knowing um, my brothers the way I do. If they were to come back, I think yeah. they're done. They're over. Because Hamish the state. was at West Coast. He's just living there now. He's, yeah, he he's, loves it. He's very good match with Luke Shuey. Yeah, hey, yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, yeah. they get along like a house on fire. I, I just think they're um, they just love the they love West Australia. They love yeah. the lifestyle. They feel super comfortable. They've got their lives set up there, and um, I think that's showing with Andrew's footy. He's killing it. So yeah. um, hopefully he doesn't keep killing it so much that we don't win the flag. But um, um it's good to see him play well. It is, um, mate. What's next for you? Uh, I want a I've footy. A, footy. Give me a footy one, but then give me a like off field. What's I was next? Give you goals. a golf one. Okay, and, and golf. That's the one I want, mate. Um, so. Um, I'm very excited, as I said, touched on finishing uni. I'll get that one out of yep. the way. I can't wait. I'm going to pop a champagne bottle and spray it all over myself and have an awesome time doing that when I finish that at, in about a month's time, a couple of months' time. Golf, oh, I'm on we'll 4.7. We'll have to catch up and keep talking about finance, man. Yeah, <laughs> I know. The people just want to hear it desperately. I, sorry, they'll have to come <laughs> yeah, next time. sorry, but, guys. Um, finance Golf, I'm going to try and... So, Jaden Hunt's off 3.8. I want to be the best golfer at Melbourne. Yeah. So I've got a bit of work to do there, but I feel like it's sort of coming together. Um, Can you take me to Raw? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. I asked this on the show because you can't really say no. No, no, no. I could easily say no. Okay. Do, you, do you own a belt and white socks? I see what I make up in talent on the course. I make up in like golf kits. Sure. So we're sweet. As yeah. long as you got white socks and a belt, you can wear honestly whatever you want. Okay. So you're absolutely welcome. Thank you. But I'll um I'll be working on my golf game hard, and then with footy, I think um you know we spoke about before motivating i've got i know blokes who <coughs> sorry broke down in tears when i want a flag and they weren't there to see it so my voice is going on me a bit um winning a flag in melbourne it's podcast in front of endurance everyone. mate i know <laughs> you have a show but like this is real yeah, what's pod- the time on this <laughs> this one? is podcast one endurance, hour mate. so we ours goes for 40 minutes <laughs> yeah. i never get to this yeah, point yeah yeah but um i'll take you to the deep end my man yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully you know we spoke about it like um the motivation to win a flag for our supporter base um, here in Melbourne is huge. So that's what's driving our group at the moment. And, mm. um, you know, I think we've made a good start of it. But as I've touched on, we've got so much more developing um, and building as a team to do. But, you know, we've got the belief and, you know, we're up for the fight. So it's um, going to be an exciting season of footy to be a Melbourne supporter. Hopefully we can um, replicate the success and... Um, yeah, that's probably that's all that's going on. Really How exciting. What about you? What's going on with you? Oh, what's going on with me? Well, I want to get handicap. I, I want to get my handicap down to like fifteen. I'd be happy with that. Yeah, that's a good. Like that's a good target. Around that, I'm I'm really enjoying being off like nineteen twenty two. You get like the two points yeah. sort of every hole. You can still hit some like like you know. Yeah. It's, it's fun golf. And look, I understand that there'll come a tipping point. I suspect where that will. You get that bored with fade it. and then you'll be like, geez, I should be playing better. Yeah. And how long have you been playing? No, only like literally six months. Yeah, so that'll yeah. come eventually. So, you, it's, you're in the honeymoon phase and so it's great. So this is what it. I mean at the moment. This is what my week's like next week. I, like I have a serious fucking addiction to this. Sure. I've just signed up at a course. Whereabouts? So I've signed up at La Trobe oh, yeah, near nice. me, but I've put my name down at PK. Oh, that takes about five years to get yeah, in. Yeah, that's a, I would never say this. Stephen May, do you know it's him mate, at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he, he, still, he still will not come. He will not invite me to yeah, that okay. course. Well, 
I would never say this in front of him, but that's a ripping course. Yeah, it is. So you should get on. So there. Sam Doherty's there. Yeah. Um, Adam Baldwin, one of my mm-hmm. good friends. Yeah, there's a lot of lot of people there. Ross Flanagan, yep. great great man. Um, but yeah, signed up there. Put my name down there. I'm actually on a barn bugle next wow, two weeks. That's huge. Yeah, so going there. Are you sure you don't want to talk about finance? Uh, no, no. <laughs> We could. Golf's boring. Oh, next time, next time. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um, so, yeah, that's for me. But I don't know, man. I wanted. I, we were talking some business off air. We were. I really want to get you guys into producing, some podcast into the stuff. studio, you and Gorney to... Yeah, watch this space, everyone. Yeah, um, I'm about to cut Melbourne's bread really <laughs> badly and get them in. So watch this oh, space on that one. That. But that's next for me, bro. I cannot thank you enough for your time. No, I really, really mine. appreciate it. I know you're a busy man. Um, yeah, can't thank you enough for your openness, your honesty, and just your insights. It's yeah, well, great. mate, thanks very much for having me. It's yeah. um, long overdue probably from it that is. Can we do it again? Maybe? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We'll get Gus and Gorney on. We'll get the, yeah. whole, get the whole team yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, we will. It'll yeah. be good. No, yeah. thanks for having me. And we've got the game at Melbourne. They're all in Melbourne. Lock that in. Yeah. Mark my words. And finance next time. <laughs> yeah, done. <laughs> See you, mate. Thank you.